more of you. God, we don't care about the Super Bowl. We don't care about football. We don't care about hors d'oeuvres. God, we want you. God, we ask that you just give us more of you, God. Help us to get as excited about you as we do about these menial things in our lives that don't matter. God, man, our perception is so skewed. You give us life. You give us freedom. You give us redemption. And yet we get excited about a sport. God, again, I just ask that you change our hearts, God. Change our priorities. We want more of you in our lives, in our work, in our families. God, we need you. And that's evident, God. God, I just ask that you prepare our hearts and our minds for your word this morning and speak through Pastor Glenn. Help us to learn something new that we didn't know before, God. You're glorious and we love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, you can be seated. Have you ever um, been in a parking lot holding one of these, hoping somebody would show mercy on you? You know? If you're a man, you're not allowed to ask for help. You're supposed to just, you know, have somebody come up and, and, and plug them in for you. I, I, I've seen it many times, you know, somebody just stranded, they got that helpless look on their face, and they're standing in front of their car with their hood open, waiting for somebody to show up, you know, to plug them in. The, the person's power's dead. They got, there's nothing, no energy to get the car going, and, and he's got everything he needs. He's got the, the, the batteries that's going to hold the power. He's got the cables that'll connect to the power, but... He has no power, and he needs to get connected in order to to get running again, right? Well, if I pull up to him on my moped and decide to hook up to his truck with my moped, no matter how hard I pedal, I will not have enough power for him, right? So he needs the correct power source. He needs to be plugged into the right thing in order to get get him started. Well, that's... That's what's happening in today's text. We're going to be in, in, in Luke chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Um, because what's been happening in Luke is the Lord, last week he started talking about connecting to the Word of God, right? And the idea is that the Word of God is the power source. The Word of God is that thing which gives us power. He talked about uh, um, it allowing roots, allowing it to take root in our lives so it'll produce fruit. That fruit is the power. Let me, let me read you Romans chapter 1, verses uh, 16 to 18. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Romans is saying that that the gospel, the word of God, is our power, is the power for salvation. Now, since the Lord is talking about us connecting to His Word, His Word is our power, this next section of Luke, of Luke 8, we're going to see how God's Word actually becomes power in our life to be able to to survive life. Now, the context of these verses follows Jesus giving that that parable of the soils. Remember, He talked about the, the different kinds of dirt that the seed falls on and, and the, when the farmer is planting his crops. And, he, and, and it was a comparison. The dirt represented man's heart. The seed represented the Word of God. Some of the seed falls on hard trampled ground. Some falls uh, on, on, on rocky soil where it springs up but doesn't have anything to hold it. And some falls on good ground, right? And he just, he just tells us that there are different conditions of the heart by which the Word of God produces fruit. And in this parable of the sower, these examples are, are us. And, and we closed last week in verse 15. Um, it said, but the ones, the seeds, the, uh, that's the word, that fell on the good ground, those having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So this open heart allows the word of God to come in, allows it to grow, and allows us to be able to produce fruit in our life. That's, that's our power. Now, throughout the Bible... The Word of God is 
called light. That's important we know that for what's going to come in these verses. Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, The unfolding of your word gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. And Psalm 43, verse 3, Oh, send out your light and your truth and let them lead me and let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. The word of God is a guide. The word of God is a light that shows us the pathway to God, right? So the, the, the light of the word is, is our power source. Now, when he begins verse 16 of, of chapter 8, he says, no one when he lights a lamp. He all of a sudden starts talking about a lamp, a light, a, 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 something that lights, lights a way. After talking about receiving the word, and, and then immediately launching into the story of a lamp, we're supposed to make a connection. The connection is, the Word of God is light. And the question is, what do we do with the light? Well, let's read it. Um, Jesus says, well, the one thing you don't do is you don't cover it up. Look at verse 16. It says, no one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand so that those who enter may see the light. So when you have the light of God, when, you, when you've made yourself that soil that can receive the word of God and it sprouts within us, what you're supposed to do with that is if you have the, word, the, the light of the word of God, you're supposed to let it shine. You're supposed to let it out, let people see it, let people understand it, right? But we're full of excuses, excuse uh, number 57, but they won't get it. They won't understand it. They'll, they'll, they'll reject it. Well, that's what he's been talking about with the soil. Some receive it, some reject it. Some it sinks in, some it bounces off, right? And, and so that's the whole point. Yes, they're going to reject. Yes, some will receive, some will work. But our job is to be the light and let them sort it out. But this idea of them rejecting it, he's about to say, but that's not going to be for long. Look at verse 17. He says, but for nothing that is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything that is hidden that will not be known and come to light. Meaning, the teachings that Jesus has been wrapping in parables, remember I told you a parable is, 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 is constructed in such a way that people who want to believe, they'll get the meaning. The people who don't want to believe, they'll miss it. So a parable kind of weeds out the, the, the hearts that are, that are receptive to God versus the hearts that are rejecting God. And so the, when he's speaking in parables, he's saying some will get it, some won't. But a day's coming when everybody will get it, when everybody will understand it. It's not going to be hidden for long. It, the truth will come out. In fact, look at Isaiah 45, verse 22 and 23. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, is talking about Jesus. And he says this. He says, look at me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out um, of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue shall take an oath. What, what, what Isaiah is teaching about Jesus is that one day everybody will believe in him. Everybody will understand that he is the Messiah. So, here's the point. The truth of the word of God is going to be vindicated. If you have the Word of God in you, if you get it, if you understand it, there's going to be a day when everybody will understand it. If you're putting it out, if you're that light that's shining for people and nobody's paying attention, nobody's getting it, they're rejecting you, well, one day they're going to know. And one day that work that you've been doing to try and shine the light on the glory of God will be vindicated. So he says, so therefore, verse 18, take heed how you hear. He says, be careful how you hear the Word of God, because you've got to be the right kind of soil to receive it. Look what he says. For whoever has to him, more will be given. He says, be careful how you hear, because if you have the truth, you're going to get more truth. Well, more what? Well, more hunger for the Word of God. When you set your heart on wanting to get to know God and wanting to get to know God through His Word, and you begin to study that word, you're going to develop this hunger inside of you that wants more. That's not going to be satisfied with the status quo. You're going to want to dig deeper. You're going to want to know it. You're going to want this to, to penetrate. 
Whoever has, more will be given. What else? More understanding. The Spirit of God will begin to open this to you and you begin to understand things. More blessing. More knowledge of God's grace. You'll see it. It'll come out to you in the Word of God. The more you seek to, to devour this Word of God and know it, the more God will reveal truth from it. More strength. More hope. Because this is pointing to a future where God's people are blessed in spite of the difficulty, in spite of the trials that we face today. Whoever has, more will be given. So be careful how you hear. Then he says the opposite. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away from him. Well, what do they think they have? Well, if you're a Pharisee in Jesus' day, you think you have spirituality. You think, well, I'm a spiritual guy. I follow the law. I do everything. You know, and they think they're, they're highly spiritual. But it was just empty religion. They thought they had wisdom. Because they looked at Jesus' teachings and thought they were foolishness. And one day their wisdom is going to be seen as foolishness. They thought they had salvation. But one day they're going to find out that salvation by works was just works done in vain. There's going to be a lot of souls... <laughs> standing outside the gates of heaven one day, realizing that what they thought they had was really nothing. They're, gonna, they're in for a rude awakening. Let me read you Luke chapter 13, verse 24 to 27. It says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able when once the master of the house rises up and shuts the door. And you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer you and say, I don't know you. Where are you from? And then you will begin to say, but we ate and, and, and drank at your presence and we taught in your streets. But he'll say, I don't know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. See, there's going to be a lot of souls in heaven that think they know, think they have this spirituality, think they have answers when, when they're ignoring the Word of God and seeking to understand on their own power, in their own way, and they're going to weigh in for a rude awakening saying, one day they'll understand and it'll be too late. The truths of the Word of God are going to be vindicated one day. Everybody will realize one day, this was truth. And for many, it, it's going to be late. Too late. So if you have the truth of the Word of God in you, if that, that seed has been planted and you, you've allowed it to come in and, and grow and begin to prosper and make fruit, your job, your obligation, is to let that light shine. Let it out. Let people see the truth. The primary power of the Word of God is that it is truth. It is unchangeable. It is, it is ultimately reliable. Everything this Bible says will happen, will happen. There is not one truth in this Word of God that shall not pass. Everything will come to light. And in the end, everyone, every knee will bow to Jesus. Everyone will confess Him. As the Lord. For some, it'll be a late confession. But everybody will acknowledge it. We need to shine the light so that those we love don't find themselves on the wrong side of that gate. That's why they need to know the truth. That's why we need to shine. Well, the next thing we see in the Word of God is it has the power to create a new identity. Verse 19, it says, Then his mother and his brothers came to him so that he could not approach, because of, and they could not approach because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. A couple of things you need to understand about what's happening here to Jesus. Number one, at this time in his ministry, his own siblings, his brothers and sisters, do not believe in him. They do not look at Jesus as the Messiah. 
In fact, there's, there comes a time when his own brothers will try to send him to Jerusalem to be killed. They will challenge him at the, at the height of, of, of the danger of his, the, the Pharisees wanting to kill him. When everybody in the city of Jerusalem is looking out for the Messiah, wanting to stop him before the Passover, his brothers are going to say, well, if you really are the Messiah, you should go show yourself in Jerusalem, which is sending him to his death. His own siblings do not believe he's the Messiah. Now, add that to the fact that right now in his ministry, the religious leaders have already begun to plot how they can take him out. He has already become a thorn in their side. His gathering is growing. The people are responding. There is a following of people they're calling the way, and, and they're getting to know who he is, and they want to stop him because he threaten, threatens their way of life. So they're already plotting to kill Jesus, right? Now add that to the fact that he is here now in Galilee, standing in the open, preaching and inciting the anger of the Pharisees. So his brothers and sisters and mom come to take him home as if he's some kind of deranged danger to himself. I mean, I can actually hear them saying, come on, brother, just stop, just, just come home. Just end this madness. And they're going to try and save him from himself. But look at his response, verse 21. It says, but he answered and said to them, my mother and my brother are these who hear the word of God and do it. In the other Gospels, we see that he points to the disciples. When this question comes, he looks at the disciples and says, These are my mothers and brothers. These, this is my family. These who hear my word and, and obey. That's, that's the point he's making. His, his connection to us and our connection to him has nothing to do with flesh and blood. Our connection is found in the word of God. That's what brings us together with God. That's what brings us together with Christ. Look at Galatians chapter 3, uh, 26 to 29. It says, For we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And as many as you as were baptized in the Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are, Adam's, are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In this church, we have people that live their entire life born and raised in California. We have people that are transplants from, from Ohio into our church. We have people that were born in Mexico. People born in the Philippines. People that were born in, in, uh, in Kenya. We have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have Independents, we have male, we have female, we have rich, we have poor. We have people with PhDs sitting next to people who've never finished high school. And yet, we're all one. We're one body of Christ. We're all connected by the Word of God. Our belief in, in what this Bible teaches is the thing we all have in common. That's the thing that levels the ground around all of us that makes us all the same. We believe that this Bible has call, called for us to fall in love with a Messiah who has come to give his life for us. And if we receive him as Lord, then, then he gives us eternal life. And, and we've, many of us have received that promise. Many of us are, are looking forward to eternal life. Many of us are, are valuing this word and wanting to give it away and pass it on to other people. That makes us one. That makes us a family. We're connected not by flesh and blood. We're connected by the word of God. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. That's why he turns to his disciples and says, this is my family. These who hear the word of God and do it. See, this word of God has changed our identity. From whatever it was we are or who we think we are or what we've done or whatever that past is to child of God the son and daughter of the Most High. That's, that's our identity. The Word of God has changed that. It's made us children of God. And Jesus says that's what connects us together. That's what brings us together. That's truly who our family is. That's the power of the Word of God. Well, 
the next truth about the power of God comes, comes out of a storm. For Jesus, ministry is tough. He's got, at this time in his life, thousands of people around him, thousands of people that are coming to him. And he's dealing with these people in long hours with heavy emotional need and, and, and things, exhausting stuff that they're asking from. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. And so he's working nonstop and he's exhausted. And the only time he ever gets a break is when he can sneak away, when he can, when he can find uh, uh, some time to be alone. And this is one of those times where he, he makes, it a, 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 he makes a, an escape. He, he climbs into a boat, verse 22. It says, Now it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. See, in his mind, he's thinking, Well, at least the eight and a half miles across the lake is going to give me some time to rest. And what he would typically do is he'd hop into a boat and he'd sail to another spot. All the people on the shore would have to run around the lake to get to the other side to, to greet him on the other side. And it would give him a, a few moments of peace. So he says, let's get in the boat, let's go across. Thinking, okay, I can, I can do that. And he's exhausted, it says, verse 23. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake. The Sea of Galilee is 686 feet below sea level. It is, it is in the midst of a bowl. See that, the, the, the topographical map there? It's, it comes in, the, the land comes in over the desert and drops down onto the Sea of Galilee. And it just literally sits in a bowl. So as the, as the winds come from, from, uh, from across the desert uh, the, the, and, or across the Mediterranean, they're building up steam and they're coming up the side of the slopes and they slam down on the Sea of Galilee, which makes sea, the Sea of Galilee susceptible to sudden windstorms and sudden storms out of nowhere. And this is, this is one of those moments where a storm comes in that they weren't expecting and they're caught. It says uh, in verse 23, And they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. Mark, Mark actually adds the word that says, Don't you even care that we're dying? And he arose and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. Mark says that he said, Peace, be still. The, the idea here is that Jesus scolded the wind and the rain and the waves like a parent would scold a child. Shh! Stop! Be quiet! He scolds the wind and the, and the waves. And look what happens. And they ceased and were calm. He scolds the wind and the rain and... Pff, dead silence. Now, the disciples could have woke Jesus up and said, Lord... <laughs> You need to calm this storm. It's going crazy right now. We're going to die. Because they should have known that he had the power to calm the storm. He's the Messiah. Or they could have just let it go. Lord, you said we were going to the other side. Okay, that means you're going to get us to the other side. No matter what, we'll just ride out the storm. But instead, they wake him up saying, we're dying here. Their fear showed that they didn't have faith in Jesus. They didn't have faith in him being the Messiah who can control the wind and the waves because they literally feared for their life. Now, I love this scene. Jesus stands up. They wake him up. He goes to the bow of the boat. He looks over the ocean and says, Shh! Be still! The waves just flatten out. The wind ceases. He turns to the disciples. Where is your faith? Where's your faith? And look what it says. And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? He commands even the wind and the water, and they obey him? Jesus's, several of Jesus' disciples were fishermen. 
They'd spent their entire life on that, on that ocean, on that, on that lake, the Sea of Galilee. They knew how to sail a boat. They knew the power of the wind. They knew the suddenness of these storms and, and the danger that was connected to the wind and the waves of the Sea of Galilee. And for Jesus just to step up out of his boat and go, shh, blew their mind. Because they all of a sudden saw him have power over a power that ruled their life. They saw that he could just speak to the wind and the waves and it would obey. And it says they were afraid and marveled. Basically saying, wow, who is this guy? It was a whole new level of power for them. Church, if, if Jesus' words have the power to calm a raging sea, don't you think that just perhaps His words can still a storm in your life? I mean, if He could step on a boat and say, shh, stop, and the ocean goes flat, don't you think He can bring peace to something happening to you? You know, we, 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 as Christians, we, we throw it out there kind of clichéic when we say, trust the Lord, He can calm your storms. It sounds so trite to say it like that. But that's literally what happened here. He calmed the storm. And his word, his words have the power to make storms stop, to bring peace in the midst of a storm. I did two funerals. I was at two funerals this week. And it, for Christians, a funeral is kind of an odd thing. In one sense, there's an acknowledgement that there's sadness. But at the same time, it's a celebration. Because we understand the truth about death as Christians. Jesus, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. You see, that knowledge can bring peace in the midst of a storm. When the sadness hits and, and, and you're feeling it and, and you're broken hearted and everything else, God reminds you, you know what? He believed in me. He's not dead. He's with me. He's with me. That can bring peace. Sometimes we get into this position where, where we begin to look at our life and we're racked with guilt of, of things in the past and, and man, I've blown it so many times and, and I, I'm not the kind of guy I should be and I just know God's not happy with me. Romans 4, verse 7 and 8 says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And so when we're racked with this storm of guilt and storm of regret and everything else, God says, relax. Because if I've forgiven you, it's over. It's, it's not on you anymore. It's been forgiven. And I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. The Word of God tells us in Hebrews 4, 16, we can come boldly to the throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy in our time of need. We have the right as sons and daughters of God, to walk to the throne of God and say, God, I need your help on this one. I need you to get me through this one. See, this is not a book of, of, of cute sayings. It's not a book of, of catchphrases or, or anything else. This is a book that, that has the ability to give us what, the, what Jesus says is abundant life. A life of quality. A life of, of help. A life of, of goodness. This... This book has the ability to bring truth to our life that could set storms at ease. And it's not just wise sayings, it's truths. It's knowledge, it's proven. And I tell you, if you ask anybody in this room, has the Lord ever calmed your storm? They'll say yes, many times. And trust me, many times in the future He'll do the same. Because this, this is a book for life. For living. God with a word can bring peace to your storm. 
and they're all in there. Help for every kind of storm you'll ever encounter. Well, the, the final power uh, from God's Word that we're going to look at today is, is the power to restore sanity. You ever feel like life is just insane? That things around you are just going crazy? Everybody's nuts, I'm nuts, everything's, nothing's working right, you know, it just, it seems like life is so insane sometimes. God's Word has the power to restore sanity. Verse 26, it says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes. They, after the storm, they sail on, and they arrive at the Gadarenes, which is opposite of Galilee. And when he stepped out onto land, there met him a man, a certain man from the city, who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. All right, well, the fact that this guy lived amongst the dead shows you just how far his insanity has taken him. He is living in a state of perpetual uncleanness because he's living amongst the dead. He's living like an animal, naked, uncovered, and, and, and completely out of control. It says, and he's been in that condition for a very long time. Verse 28, and when he saw Jesus, he cried out, and he fell down before him with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now this, this was not the man speaking. This was the demon controlling the man speaking. And notice, not only does he know Jesus' name, but he acknowledges who Jesus really is. Your son of the Most High God. And he recognizes Jesus' power. Look at the next line. He says, I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, and it, it had often seized him. And he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. <clears throat> and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. These demons yielded a lot of power in this man's life. Literally, the demons controlled his life. It, 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 it made him a threat to other people. It gave him strength. It controlled his speech. It controlled the way he lived. It turned him into an animal for a very long time. But that demon that had all that power in his life was forced to acknowledge the authority of Jesus. And then Jesus asked him a question. What is your name? And he said, Legion. Because he had many demons had entered him. Now, let me just clarify. Legion is not a name. It's a number. There are six, thousand, six to 8,000 men in a Roman legion. Now, this is not saying that he had 6,000 demons. This is the demon saying to Jesus' question, not a name, but a threat. We are many. That's an ominous statement. What's your name? Oh, there's a lot of us. That's a threat. That's meant to intimidate. But at the same time, these legion of demons know exactly who they're facing. Look at verse 31. And they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. They said, don't send us away. And then it says, now there was a herd of many swine. Mark tells us there's 2,000 swine. There was a herd of many swine that was feeding there on the mountain. And so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. Now, a lot of people ask me, why would he do that? Why would he just not send them into the abyss? You know, there's going to be a day when the Lord will stand on his throne his judgment seat 
and he will cast away all the demons in the demonic realm into, into the abyss forever. But that day is not yet. That day is not here. For now, Satan is having his way with this world. But the day is going to come when the Lord is going to triumph over evil and all those will be put away. But this isn't that day. So when they ask, just send us to the pigs, he grants their wish. He sends them to the pigs. It says, then the demons went out, verse 33, went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. Now this tells you one of two things. Either it shows us that pigs don't like to be demon-possessed, or it shows us what the demonic realm really wants to do with us. John 10.10 says, The thief does not come but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what these demons want. That's what they are going to accomplish, even to their own demise. They're going to destroy this herd of pigs, even if it costs them their own peril. So the pigs run and they fall into the lake and they drown. Verse 34, then those who fed them saw what happened and they fled and told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what had happened. So they, the farmers run back to the city and said, hey, we just lost 2,000 pigs. And so the leaders of the community come out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus. Now here's the line I need you to catch. Watch this. See this in your mind, please. And he found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. The guy who used to break their chains, the, the, the crazy naked guy that lived among the dead, the guy who made them take the long way around because he was dangerous, was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. You see, the power of the words of Jesus can bring sanity into chaos, church. The power of the words of Jesus can make craziness into sanity. Because we live in a chaotic, insane world that doesn't make much sense. Until we open the Word of God and see who controls it and who ultimately wins in the end. The words of God can bring sanity to chaos. This guy was dressed, cleaned, calm and quiet and completely sane. And look at their response. It says, and they were afraid. You remember when Jesus calmed the storm? And the sailors who knew the storms, knew the sea. It said the same reaction. They were afraid because they, they got it. When the sailor who knows the sea sees somebody be able to speak to the sea and calm it with a word, they understand that level of power because they know the power of the sea. This is the same thing. These guys have been dealing with this demonic man for a long time. They put him in chains. They put guards on him and, and they couldn't control this demon. He was strong and he, he was fierce and he was dangerous. And when they hear that Jesus did it with a word, that's a whole level of power that they now can understand this guy has. And look at this. It says, verse 36, They also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed so these pig farmers go back and say hey you remember that crazy guy that lives in the tomb Jesus healed him with just words he just said it and the, and the demons went into pigs and the pigs ran into the it was just words this guy that they've been fighting all this time this guy that has been a threat Jesus healed him made him sane with just words And so they're terrified at a whole level of power that they've, they understand because they've dealt with this guy before. 
They knew the power of these demons, and he just spoke them out? Now look at their reaction. And the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. That's, that's a strange reaction to God doing something amazing. Can you imagine? God does this huge miracle and they say, oh great, now go away. Just leave. Partially, it's due to the fact that <laughs> Jesus just cost them 2,000 pigs. I mean, that's a lot of income. Just went into the lake and died. But mostly, church, that's the reaction from people who are close to God. You remember the soils we talked about? They're the hard trampled down soil where the seed of the word of God comes and, and it doesn't, isn't allowed to penetrate. It just sits on the top and you know, the birds take it away and it, it has no, no penetrating effect. That's who these guys are. They're, they're seeing this miracle of God. Their hearts are so hard that, that all they're thinking about is this guy just cost us 2,000 pigs. That's too expensive for us. We don't care what he does. Get out. Leave. And their hard hearts are completely closed to the miracle. And so they send them away. Now, fortunately, <laughs> this is not a story about those people. This is a story about the guy who lived in the tombs. And watch how God takes this whole thing, everything we've read so far in chapter 8, and just puts it all in one package and ties it up in a great bow. It says, verse 38, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with them. But Jesus sent him away anyway, saying, Return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. You remember how we started this? Those who receive the word of God, those with the good hearts and let the word of God come in, the word of God comes in, grows roots and produces fruit, right? That fruit is the light of the word of God. That light is something that needs to be shown to the world. We need to sh let this light in us shine so that the world will see and know God, right? Well, Jesus sends him home so that he can go be a light on the great things that God has done. He basically says, no, 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 you go home and you tell people what God has done for you. You go be a light for God. It says, and he went his way and he proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus has done for him. You see, the word of God not only restored his sanity, but it also gave him a brand new purpose. A brand new way to live. A brand new message to share. A new light to shine. Now let's go back to that verse I opened with. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, but also for the Greek for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The Word of God is the power source for life. And not just this life, but life eternal. And if you let it, if you obey it, if you, if you learn to trust it, it will change your life. It will give you new power, new, a new light to shine. And if you do what God told that man from the Gadarenes, go and tell people what great things God has done for you. Then not only will you be a light shining in their life, but you will change their life. Can you imagine being this man that was healed? And you go back to the very city that you hid from all those years. And people were so used to seeing you as the crazy naked guy. 
And all of a sudden you show up and people are saying, I know you from somewhere. How do, how do I know you? Well, you remember that guy in the tombs that ran around naked all the time? That was me. I was that guy. And the Lord, He spoke to the demons inside of me and told them to get out. And He gave me back my life. He restored my sanity. And He's told me to come and tell you about great things God wants to do in your life. I've said it a million times in this church, church. And I'm going to keep saying it until the day I leave. Until my feet hit heaven. Your job as a Christian, as a child of God, is to go tell people what God has done for you. That's what He expects out of you. Go tell people what God has done. In other words, go be a light for the power of God. That's what this is teaching. That's why we went through the soils. That's why we go through the light. That's why we, we have all these things connected so that when we get done, we understand. We have a job. To go be a light for God. Now go. Be a light. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord Jesus, I love your word. It is life changing. It is amazing. There's so much truth and there's so much life in this, Lord. There's so much direction. There's so much calling. This word is alive. This word is real. This word is, is important and it's, and it's dire for the lives of those I love. And so God, I pray for this church that we would be light in the midst of the darkness of this world. That we would take the truths of God and that you teach us and, the, and the, the difference you made in our life and let us communicate that to others. Church, we want to be the light. We want to glorify Jesus. And we pray for that power and that will in Jesus' name. Amen. God has done amazing things in many of our lives. He's healed us in many ways and brought great things to many of us. And if you, if you can testify to that, you have a commission, a great commission, to go and tell people what God has done for you. You do that, you will be a light shining in darkness. Go be the light. Let's worship the Lord. If you need prayer, I'll be right here with some leadership. Meet your tables in the back if you want to take the Lord's Supper. Let's just stand, let's worship the Lord.